Hello, welcome to Prairie Conservation Action Plan's Prairie's Got the Goods Week. My name is Caitlin Morose and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Check out other events going on for Prairie's Got the Goods Week. Don't miss Paige Englot presenting about A Loose Canada, working with farmers to sustain agriculture, wildlife and natural spaces for all Canadians. That's today at 3 p.m. Tomorrow at noon, Dr. Kenneth Belcher with the University of Saskatchewan will be talking about value and policy considerations for native prairie ecological goods and services. If you are in the Swift Current area, swing by Casey's Dining Room for a presentation by Rancher Stewardship Alliance, Inc. about valuing ecosystem services provided by native prairie. That's Thursday at 7 p.m. I would like to take a moment to note that in-kind support for this project has been given by the Grant Ranch. This project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Now a bit about our presenter. Sherry Grant wears many hats on the Grant Ranch. From bookkeeping, secretary and running people to the field, you can say she truly does it all. Sherry graduated from the University of Saskatchewan with a Bachelor of Science in Home Economics in 1974, but her learning hasn't stopped there. Sherry has served on many boards over the years, some of which she has been passionately involved include Valmory Ambulance and Canadian Western Agribition. She was awarded the Farm Credit Canada Rosemary Davis Women in Agriculture Award in 2013. Sherry was featured by Chatelaine Magazine in the Top 100 Women Entrepreneurs in 2000. One of her most recent endeavors is Where Beef Comes From, a children's book she co-wrote with daughter-in-law Avery Grant, which is now a featured book for agriculture in the classroom. In her spare time, Sherry enjoys photographing her world. She is passionate about capturing the life around her, the ranch, flora and fauna, as well as her growing family, especially her 10 grandchildren. Before we begin, I would like to mention that if you have any questions during the presentation, please type it into the question section on your webinar dashboard. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And now I will turn it over to Sherry. Sherry, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, but I have a problem because my computer locked up. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's okay. Just take a minute to, um, to get the presentation going. Um, what I'll do is I'll just take the control back, and um, while we're waiting for Sherry's um, technical difficulties there, I would just like to show everyone for Prairie's Got the Goods Week, we have lots of events going on, um, and just check out the PCAP website. So all of our events are listed under Upcoming Events, Ecological Goods and Services Week. And we have an event calendar there going on. Um, all of the events that PCAP is offering this week are free. Um, for the webinars, you do need to register ahead of time. And just clicking the register here link. And then follow the link that you're sent by email afterwards. We also have a really great presentation going on by Tara Muller and Davidson with Lonesome Dove Ranch near Pond, Saskatchewan. And she'll be talking about a perfect partnership, ranching and native prairie. If you're interested in wetlands, Ducks Unlimited Canada will be doing a presentation about wetlands got the goods. And that's Thursday at 3 p.m. And you just need to register through the PCAP website for that webinar. On Friday, Dr. Cameron Carlisle with the University of Alberta will be doing a presentation about biodiversity in Alberta's grassland. And again, just click that registration link. All of these webinars are being recorded 
and will be uploaded to the PCAP YouTube page. And so you can just check the YouTube channel for past presentations that you may have missed. How's it going there, Sherry? Any luck? Okay, I'm reopening, so just if you can just give me just a little bit of time. Perfect. To get this open. Perfect. I would just like to mention to our listeners that on Monday evening, Trevor Harriet with Public Pastures and Public Interest did a really interesting presentation called Grassland Matters. And you can access that presentation through the PCAP YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash user slash SKPCAP for a recording of it. And Sue Michaelski's presentation with Ranchers Stewardship Alliance in Swift Current Tomorrow will also be recorded and uploaded to that same YouTube channel. PCAP also has a Facebook page, and we have lots of interesting facts and resources going on this week on that, on that page. So if you haven't liked our Facebook page yet, be sure to do that, and you can stay in tune with what's going on for Prairie's Got the Goods Week. PCAP also put out an infographic, so some information about what Native Prairie is and some of the goods and services that are offered by Native Prairie. Um, so you can check that out on the, um, on the PCAP website. Okay, I think I'm, I'm getting close. I'm just having trouble as to which window it's going to show on. Okay. What we can do is I, um, when you're ready to launch it, I'll pass you control, Sherry, and then we can just make sure that we're looking at the right window. Okay, let's try it and let's see what happens. <laughs> Should I be able to see your... your um... Oh, there we go. So I click show my screen? Yes. <clears throat> and I've clicked that. Yes, and we can see you're in presenter mode now. Okay, so can you see the presenter mode side or the presentation side? The presenter mode side. Okay, so I have to switch screens if I think I know how to do that. Perfect. That looks great, Sherry. Do we have the correct screen showing now? Yes, that's that's perfect. Okay, then I think we are almost ready to go. Okay. Thank you very much to all of our listeners here for tuning in today and for your patience with our technical difficulties. And Sherry, whenever you're ready to begin, go ahead. Okay, well, a webinar, as you can tell, is a very new experience for me, and um, internet in rural Saskatchewan does not always cooperate in the way that um, we would hope it would. So, here we go. Um, Grant Ranch is where uh, I live. It's the um, operation that we raise cattle and livestock and feed and food on. And Grant Ranch includes myself, of course, my husband, Lynn, his brother Dean and family, Jacques, our master mechanic, Vadim, who manages the winter feeding for the calves, and Andrea, who's so patient looking after newborn calves. And then, of course, a few of us who pitch in with extra hands as needed. Today, I'm going to talk about where we're located, what we do, how we do it, and why it matters to us. So on this slide, you can tell that we are right down in that southwest corner of Saskatchewan, that red dot. It's the dry brown soil zone where we have an average annual precipitation of less than 350 millimeters. We have some farmland adjacent to the Montana border. We, are right, we have some right beside Grasslands National Park, and we have grazing land as far as 30 miles north of the border. The green star on that map is where our son, Logan, his wife, Avery, and their family farm. 
In this area of the province, we believe that the majority of our land area is best suited to perennial grass, which means we raise cattle. This particular group is being moved to a new winter grazing location on a sunny January day. We also grow hay for our livestock and cereal crops, including brown mustard, barley, durum, wheat, peas, and red lentils on some of our better quality land where we have fewer rocks. We look after over a thousand cows. All of these cows are wintered away from the yard out on pasture. And we appreciate the snow we receive. It provides both soil moisture and water to resupply dugouts and dams for livestock summer grazing. This photo was taken on a Sunday morning when we were moving some cows. I was standing in the back of the feed truck. Here the cows are being fed bales. The equipment you see is what we call a Dewey's bale deck mounted on the back of a truck or a round bale unroller. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with that sort of equipment. Ourselves and virtually all of our neighbors feed cows out on the pasture where the manure and urine will be dropped where it's an asset for us, providing nutrients for the grass and soil in the next and subsequent grazing seasons. These are bales that we harvested last summer, then picked and moved to the stackyard for winter feeding. We produce food using soil and solar energy from the sun and rainfall. All of these resources are finite. We often do not think about how much land is available on the globe for food production. If we think about our planet, Almost three quarters of the surface is water. Only one thirty-second of the Earth's surface has the potential to grow the food needed to feed all of the people on Earth. This small area represents the topsoil, the dark, nutrient-rich soil that holds moisture and feeds us by feeding our plants. And in 2017, we continue to put prime productive soil under concrete. Here in Saskatchewan, new developments are continuing to cover acres of excellent productive soil. This soil is the resource that we are managing to grow the food for the world. Worldwide, grazing more than doubles the land area that can be used to produce food for people. In Canada, about 68 million hectares of land is classified as agricultural land. About 30% of Canada's farmland is not considered to be economically or environmentally suitable for cultivation, but it does support sustained ruminant livestock grazing. Because of climate, topography, access, or landowner choice, almost 24% of Canada's agricultural land is uncultivated native grassland. Another 6% is maintained as tame grass pasture land. Ruminants, <coughs> excuse me, Ruminants utilize the forages and legumes, which are part of a crop rotation system <coughs> excuse me, to improve soil fertility and decrease soil erosion. Forage crops used for cattle feed are an important part of most sustainable cropping systems. They help to decrease soil erosion, they improve soil fertility, and assist in pest management. Soils are complex systems. They provide food and fiber, plus habitat, and are a filter for water, storage container and reservoir for air, and a supplier of nutrients. Soils are complex mixtures of minerals and organic matter, home to a vast array of species that continually process it, enriching it as they do. 
and there are a great variety of soil environments and a great deal of difference between the soil at the surface and the soil deeper down. The ground beneath our feet is full of living things. There are more creatures below the Earth's surface than above it. Around 25% of everything alive uses soil as a habitat, and without it, life on this planet would be impossible. Native grasslands represent an important storage of carbon, much of which is stored in the roots of the grasses and shrubs. And earlier this week, Dr. Bork provided an in-depth discussion about understanding carbon storage and greenhouse gas uptake in the grasslands. And I would absolutely refer you to that presentation for a much more complex discussion of this whole area. So what do we do on our operation to support carbon sequestration? Well, we've reduced the amount of land that we leave fallow and are working toward having plants covering the soil 100% of the time if we could, but as close to that as possible. We use a direct seed drill for our annual crops to reduce soil disturbance. We use legumes in our cropping rotations. Because we have cattle, there is little pressure on our operation to use any marginal farmland for annual cropping. It is definitely a better use of the resource for us to have the land planted to perennial grasses. As much as possible, based on location and logistics, we have used the tools of rotation grazing, managed grazing, high intensity short term grazing. We've planted shrubs and trees for windbreaks, and we do not drain our wetland areas. We believe that these are special areas that offer incredible diversity to our landscape. Much of the land we operate is best protected with a perennial grass to reduce erosion. This is why raising cattle to convert that grass into high quality beef is the best use for this land. We call this plant winter fat because of its high nutritive content during the dormant season. We use strategies like limiting cattle access to the creek as part of healthy riparian management and watering cattle away from the collection area protects water quality. In terms of cattle management, I've tried to think about the kinds of questions that you might wonder about. And I know Caitlin is also collecting questions for me to answer at the end, so if I don't answer them during the presentation. So, number one, excuse me, <coughs> do we use hormones? Yes, we do. We've done a blog post about it that explains how we replace hormones in bull calves that we have castrated, and we provide them with what we think of as a hormone therapy. Every living thing has hormones. There is no such thing as hormone-free beef, or hormone-free cabbage for that matter. In fact, a serving of cabbage contains more estrogen than a serving of beef. According to research, there's more variation between individual animals in terms of hormone content than between treated and untreated animals. And the Beef Cattle Research Council at beefresearch.ca has a significant number of informative articles and webinars on these kinds of topics. So, what about antibiotics? Do we use them? Yes, we do. Any animal that appears ill is brought into a smaller area. It's evaluated. Do they have a fever? Are they breathing normally? Based on that animal's symptoms and often a consultation with a vet, a decision is made in terms of what protocol to follow to regain health. This may include antibiotics. If it does, we follow the protocols using the correct medicine, the correct way of treating, the correct time. We document the treatments and we follow withdrawal periods. And all products have withdrawal periods before any animal can go to a processing plant. 
in the beef industry, we have something called a code of practice, which addresses many of the questions around cattle handling and pain management. This is native grass prairie. Productivity rating for this pasture is about seven head per quarter for the growing season. A quarter section is 160 acres, so that means about 23 acres per cow. And if you're not familiar with the size of an acre, um, an acre is about three quarters of a football field. So that's a lot of land area for very few cattle, and yet things like corn and potatoes <laughs> do not grow in this soil. So what else does live here? Grasslands are richly biodiverse and harbor many of Canada's most endangered or threatened species. Land used for beef cattle production represents 33% of agricultural land and it provides 68% of the wildlife habitat capacity within the agricultural landscape. So, could eating less meat result in less wildlife habitat? John McCracken, a biologist and national director of Bird Studies Canada, states, for grassland birds, the biggest issue has been the loss of grasslands, whether native prairie, rangeland, or hay fields. If it weren't for the cattle industry, we'd have lost many of these threatened bird species already. The cattle themselves have become an integral part of healthy grassland ecosystems, which originally evolved under the presence of a ruminant grazer such as a bison. Cattle now provide the disturbance necessary to drive ecological cycles and support biodiversity. The list of grassland birds in Canada that find safe haven on cattle pasture land includes everything from endangered burrowing owls to western meadowlarks. Chestnut collared longspur, vesper sparrows, long billed curlews, and even bobolinks. Swanson's hawks, and lark buntings. These sharp tailed grouse are dancing in one of our native grass pastures. Cattle play a critical role in nutrient recycling within this ecosystem. In general, the same good grazing management practices that support sustainable cattle production also support good bird habitat. It's a very mutually beneficial relationship. We use the term <clears throat> good grazing management and its meaning may feel a bit fuzzy. So here's an excerpt from a 20 10 publication by the authors listed, and it's on managing for biodiversity and livestock. And this was relating to the Western Great Plains grassland. The initial sentence stated, with beneficial management, these grasslands have great potential to revive populations of grassland birds, such as the mountain plover, lark bunting, upland sandpiper, long-billed curlew, and McAllen's longspur, which have declined over the last 30 years. Now, we may have a preconceived idea that the mixed or mixed shrub area is the ideal, but as we see on this chart, McAllen's longspur and some others are not supported in that habitat. You can see the variety of grazing pressure benefiting different bird species. And this particular paper discusses the scale-dependent approach to assist land managers in their decision-making. 
that whole concept of management in the middle may be detrimental to some species. And the use of varied stocking rates can increase natural vegetation heterogeneity, which is important to wildlife diversity. So, one way to increase vegetation heterogeneity within multiple pastures is to plan a grazing system that intentionally varies the grazing intensity, duration, and or season of use among the pastures to create differences in vegetation among pasture, pastures. So this managers then could vary the implementation of the grazing plan across different years to create a mosaic of management practice that shifts vegetation structure and composition over time and space. So in conclusion, the article states, maintaining and improving vegetation heterogeneity in grasslands is important for biodiversity. Ecosystem goods and services, long-term sustainability of ecosystems, and wildlife populations. And contemporary concerns about the potential conflicts between conservation and production goals. So looking at a small area of a managed pasture isn't the whole story. Following many years of research, Grasslands National Park has reintroduced bison to provide a ruminant in the grassland ecosystem. Many producers, like us, have an environmental farm plan and a verified beef production certification. This program is based on hazard analysis critical control points, HACCP, HACCP, with standard operating procedures for producers. It includes a verification audit to confirm all on-farm practices meet the on-farm food safety criteria. The verified beef production program is recognized by the Canada Food Inspection Agency and reinforces that the program is technically sound, meets internationally recognized standards, and has ongoing oversight by those with appropriate technical expertise and authority. Confidence in our food products starts on the farm. The next slide, which I see is taking a few minutes to load, is a short clip from Conservation Conversations, which was recorded by the Prairie Action Conservation Plan in 2015. And we'll just see how this loading occurs. But Caitlin, actually, if you have a question right now. Uh, yes, th while it's loading, um, there is a question. Um, what is your favorite part about being a rancher? <laughs> oh, that's a fun question. I love being outside. I love being out and seeing all of the, uh, the wildlife that we get the opportunity to see. I love learning about the different uh, research that's available, the different ways of doing things, the different tools that um, that are available to us. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of favorite things about that. My least favorite, yeah, that would be the bookwork. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you if we have another minute. Well, no. I think we're on. We're on. Okay. <laughs>
So, food production producers. In Canada, only 1% of the population is actual producers of food. And yet we all have a vested interest in the production of our food. We want clean air, we want clean water, we want wholesome food. So as food producers, we have a responsibility to be knowledgeable about ecosystem functions and how food production fits into a sustainable environment. And for all of us, this includes critical thinking and questioning what we hear. And I believe we need to look for the research. Research increases the knowledge base for us to do a better job and for the consumer to know that what we are doing is also meeting their needs. So this website is a source of the most recent Canadian research, including research on livestock water use, uh, which leads me right into what about the water question. Some people blame water shortages on the beef industry. So what does that mean? How much water does beef? production use. And we often see misleading answers based on how big of a number will people actually believe. So the first thing is a realization that water is considered uh, blue or gray or green depending on the source and the use. So blue water used to water cattle, irrigate pastures, forage or feed crops, and process carcasses at the packing plant. Gray water dilutes fertilizer or manure runoff associated with feed or cattle production and can be referred to as industrial water. Green water is the rain that falls on the land that's used by the plants. If it runs off, it becomes blue water. But not all rainwater is used by cattle. What about wildlife? And of course, it would rain whether there were cattle on that land or not. So some researchers add the total numbers, and because there's no data for rainfall, they estimate those numbers. They don't think about any other users. So that's kind of like attributing all the rain that falls in your yard being part of human water use. Or if you water plants, that's human water use. Except, we have to remember, water actually recycles. And all of the water use numbers are referring to gross water. So they take no recognition of water recycling, all the water that returns to that water cycle and is used again. We could think about rainfall, running off into the pond, evaporating into the atmosphere, becoming part of the next rainfall. And it's counted every time it cycles. So in most of these, if the green water was excluded, it would reduce the footprint by 94%. Wow. So really, a better understanding of the role that healthy forages and soils play in the water cycle is critical if we want to really know how the beef industry impacts ecosystem. Using blue water efficiently, managing waste appropriately, minimizing gray water is going to be increasingly important for all of us. So what makes more sense? Well, there's been some recent um, research in the area of water, and here's the results of the National Beef Sustainability Assessment which was completed by the Canadian Roundtable of Sustainable Beef, that's a mouthful, in October 2016. So the beef industry's impact on water was assessed in three different ways. So there was the use of it, there was risk, and there was pollution potential. So in terms of water use, to produce one kilogram of packed boneless beef, delivered and consumed, takes 631 gross liters of blue water. It accounts for everything from farming right through to eating. That represents 74% of the total blue water footprint. 
at this stage, it takes 235 liters per kilogram of live weight. And 80% of that is for feed crop irrigation. 19% is drinking water for cattle. So the link between water risk and cattle density was explored. And of course, because cattle production occurs in dry areas, marginal lands, those areas with low participation, and those are areas which are considered high risk. So that's the connection with the risk area. In terms of the Canadian beef industry, its blue water footprint is relatively low, primarily due to the limited amount of irrigation on feed, as well as the presence of highly efficient systems. There are about 54,000 hectares of land in British Columbia, Alberta, and Saskatchewan that are irrigated for beef feed. So based on irrigation, that would mean about 276 million cubic meters, or 16% of total water volumes for irrigation across Canada. <clears throat> so Deloitte did an assessment of a gross blue water footprint, meaning they only considered water abstracted from surface or groundwater without considering any return. And you'll note that Capper did the same approach. So these are all gross water approaches. So in the reality, Canada has a very good numbers in terms of our water footprint. Uh, we've invested a lot of time and effort into improving productivity and using fewer resources. So higher forage and crop yields mean less land used to produce the same amount of beef. Improving animal feed conversion means less forage used. So these improvements in productivity and efficiency have also produced environmental benefits. Healthy forages improve soil organic matter, so more carbon sequestration. Better feed conversion also results in less methane. So this is a 30-year comparison on these statistics. <clears throat> the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef has defined sustainable beef as a socially responsible, environmentally sound, and economically viable product that prioritizes planet, people, animals, and progress. It's a multi-stakeholder organization and it's committed to advancing sustainability. We as cattle producers understand the need to raise more beef using fewer resources while ensuring that our production practices are good for the environment. We also understand the need for the land mosaic which supports biodiversity. I want to see more bugs, bees, and butterflies, more birds and more biodiversity, both above and below ground. Our soil is the foundation of sustainability, of good food, and good environment. Our ancestors valued the soil which enables us to grow food from it today. And it's our responsibility to care for that soil so it can nourish future generations. So we are uh, advised to tell people what we do. And so as part of that, I work with the Saskatchewan Stock Growers Association, coordinating and implementing a student education program in Saskatchewan, funded by the beef producers of Saskatchewan through the Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association. As part of that program, we participate in the Agri-Ed experience for students during Canadian Western Agribition, where over 6,000 students from kindergarten to grade 8 will take part in this event each year and over 200 teachers. For students, this is an incredible one-day experience. New sights, new sounds, new smells. But for the teacher in the classroom that offers the student the preparation to attend the event, and the follow-up afterwards to interpret and integrate the experience. The teacher has the big work here. And many teachers do not have enough knowledge of the many facets of agriculture to teach these even at an elementary level. So we've worked with many ways to assist teachers with resources. And one of those is that we provide a website for educators 
uh, which allows for us to keep adding new resources and provides a place for teachers to check out what they may have heard through the news media. It's a place to go and get some of the basics. We also travel around the province to participate in student learning opportunities. Uh, Prince Albert Agricultural Education event is happening next week. Um, Swift Currents Discover the Farm event is also happening next week. Ag Adventures in Regina in association with Ag in the Classroom. Uh, Saskat Saskatoon Ag Experience, which happens in the fall. Uh, Yorkton Harvest Showdown, which also happens in the fall. And what I have learned from that is that the students range from totally fascinated, thirsty for knowledge, to totally overwhelmed by all the new stimuli. For teachers, it takes much planning and lots of energy. And they're very busy meeting their job requirements. Teachers tell us it's easier to teach information that they know. And when it comes to the cattle industry, they're not able to find resources, particularly resources written at an elementary student level. Also, that the resources they find lack clarity and do not provide age-appropriate concepts in correct context. Teachers don't have time to wade through reams of material to interpret it before preparing a lesson. So my goal was to make it easy for teachers in the classroom to teach their students about the cattle industry and the benefits of that juicy hamburger. So we thought about it and we came up with the idea of a children's book. We thought that a book written at elementary level with real pictures would be a useful support for the teacher. Um, I did not write the book. I asked my daughter-in-law, Avery, who is an elementary teacher who grew up in the city, if she would be willing to be the writer. And she did. So we worked on something that was accurate, clear, focused, with real photos that children would enjoy reading. Um, within many long distance consultations, 18 months after the idea, we had the finished product. And since then, there have been over 2,000 books distributed. The Saskatchewan Ministry of Education has endorsed this book as a resource for the elementary science curriculum, and many teachers have expressed their appreciation. This book is also available through the website, and there are resources there to support it. What else are we doing? So as producers, we are continually being asked, and in the spring of 2016, we said, OK, we began our blogging adventure. GrantRanch.ca was born. Well, <clears throat> it's been very challenging. Uh, telling our story has been very difficult for, for a variety of reasons. Firstly, we're very involved. We spend so much time doing the story. Uh, secondly, we're not writers, so telling or writing seems difficult. And thirdly, we don't know what you don't know. So even though we'd like to explain what we do, we're not sure if our terminology needs explaining or if we're answering our questions, but we've persevered. It's definitely not a one-person project. We've published 60 blog posts since our first one in March. I invite you to take a look at our site and get a glimpse into our lives. And please feel welcome to comment and ask questions. That will help us to be able to explain the things that are of interest to you. Well, are we environmentally friendly? I believe that we are the most environmentally friendly we have ever been. The Dirty 30s taught us many things about protecting soil. So we have developed many strategies to save and protect our soil. We continue to research and find strategies to increase the organic matter. And we are continually developing technologies to reduce our environmental footprint. I think we are just getting better. And thoughtful questions help us move in the right direction. Could we be better? Of course. And I believe that every year we are better. We are families that farm using corporations for management and succession planning. 
Have big corporations taken over farm ownership? Not in Canada. About 98% of farms in Canada are family owned and operated and are often handed down from generation to generation. It's difficult to describe a typical farm or ranch in Canada because every one of them is unique. Family farms come in several forms. Some are managed by families with one or more members having a job outside the farm to ensure adequate farm in family income. And in our case, two spouses work off farm. Some are retirement farms or acreages, and some are farms that often have several family members involved and perhaps additional paid employees, and we also have paid employees. These larger farms are still family owned and operated, and maybe one of the differences is that that family may not need off-farm income. Can we return to smaller, more traditional farms? Well, I don't think so. Not unless many Canadians are prepared to leave cities, go back to the farm, work long hours, pay more for food. With only less than 2% feeding the rest of us, I think it's impossible to go back to many small farms. People may feel nostalgic for the farms of yesteryear, but those people who lived and worked on them are rarely nostalgic for that very challenging way of life. The farm's low productivity supported much smaller populations. Food quality and quantity were highly unpredictable. The challenge today is to feed a growing world population without damaging or depleting soil and other resources. And for this, I don't believe the past can provide the answers. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to go back to driving the first car I owned, even if I might feel nostalgic about it. So why do we ranch? Days like this, we wonder. I asked some of the others on our operation what agriculture meant. And Danielle said, agriculture is more than just a way of making a living. It's a lifestyle that fosters respect, reliance, resilience, perseverance, humility, and love of not only the land, but also of our family and community. It's a way of life that's allowed us to teach our children the value of hard work the heartbreak of losing crops or worse animals, but most importantly allowed us to teach them perseverance in the face of many different uncertainties, to hold on tight to their faith and hold their heads up high. Andrea commented on the feeling of value to the vital part of society and the working with ecological systems. Brenna said, agriculture is being a steward of the land because land is a renewable resource and whether we are growing grass to be harvested by cattle or annual crops, we're stewarding that land to have fertile soil and effective nutrient cycles in order to contribute to a healthy functioning ecosystem that supports a diversity of plants and wildlife. Because even within annual cropping with fields of monocultures, there is diversity on that landscape with fields of different crop species interspersed with riparian areas. Vadim commented, agriculture is opportunity to cooperate together with nature, benefits for both sides, creates the most beneficial symbiosis, human and nature. I view this task as very responsible, which takes knowledge as well as right attitude to achieve the most beneficial results. Right philosophy is crucial in order to use, but not abuse. And some of the other things mentioned included watching your future grow, praying for the right amount of rain, no hail, teachable moments relationships, care, ecological management, and making a difference. In this month of March, I've gone from the joy of watching a rough-legged hawk soar overhead to the grief of seeing a baby calf's life taken by coyotes. The warmth of the afternoon sun 
warming the soil, and the chill of ice blocks being chipped out of a frozen water bowl. The sparkle of new fallen snowflakes glistening like diamonds with the power of sun and new snowfall, with the hope for an abundant season ahead. Agriculture is family, friends, pride, hard work, resiliency, innovation, life, and death. Opportunity, hope, beauty, joy, and gratitude. We are blessed with challenges which give us opportunities to grow and we are privileged to be part of a network of other producers who grow the food that nourishes all Canadians every day. We produce food, we eat the food we produce, and we want to be able to continually improve our practices. Being good isn't good enough. We want to continually get better. What we were doing 10 years ago is not what we're doing now. And what we will be doing 10 years from now will need to be different than what we are doing today. We will continue to learn, evolve, and innovate. We produce food, we care about it, and we want to do it well. Thank you everyone for taking time to listen, and Caitlin, if you have questions. Yes, thank you very much, Sherry, for the excellent presentation. It was really good. Um, before we begin with questions, I would just like to mention that links to the Grant Rant blog and conservation, conservation video that, um, that Sherry had referred to will be shared on the PCAP Facebook page later today. Um, I, it looks like there's a question here already. If anyone else has any questions... Please type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. So the first question is from a listener named Cassia. Sherry, how do you deal with drought years? What do you do to adapt? Well, in our area, drought is definitely something that we have to consider always. So part of our ad adaptation would our management of grass in terms of something called grass banking, which means that we have areas that we take less uh, of the grass from and knowing that there's going to be grass there for next year for the start of the season while the grass is growing. Uh, if we see forecast-wise that it's going to be very dry, we use things like our hayland for grazing and we look to purchase in our feed. Uh, we also consider strategies like selling some of our cattle early in the season so that there is more feed left for the remaining cattle. The, the biggest piece for us in that drought management is preparation and consideration of what's coming to make sure that we're not caught kind of at the end of our rope. Great. Thank you, Sherry. Um, the next question from one of our listeners is, um, they were reading today about, or that 3% of um, Canadians are connected to agriculture. So um, what are some things, what are the most important things that are being done to keep Canadians connected with where their food comes from? Wow, that's an awesome question. And I think, Caitlin, I would have to say that this webinar series is one way that we're offering to help Canadians stay connected and to give them opportunities to learn. There are a number of producers that are doing things like blogging that are trying to provide consumers or other Canadians 
with information about the practices on their operations. I believe all of the provincial agricultural, um, you know, the government um, areas, the agricultural um, sections of, of our government, both provincially and federally, um, offer information in terms of what agriculture is happening. But I would love to have um, the listeners offer ways that they think would be of value in terms of producers uh, providing information to consumers. So if there are any listeners out there that have any comments for Sherry, you're welcome to email her um, or contact her through her blog or type in the question now. Uh, we do have another question, Sherry, from our listener chat. He would like to know, why did you get involved in ag education? I guess for me, what I saw was that <laughs> the teachers that were in the classroom, in my, my students, my children's classrooms, um, were coming from outside agricultural areas, and the information that they were presenting to the students were not presented with a full understanding of how agricultural works. And so I thought it was important for students to have a better picture and realize that there was more information available and to start thinking about that bigger perspective. And in that whole process, understanding that for teachers, they also need that information. Um, in Saskatchewan, and I'm not as familiar with the other provinces, when the teachers go through their teacher education training, they don't have an agricultural class. They don't have a class that says, you know, how is food produced in Canada? How is food produced in Saskatchewan? And so they come out of university not having that background. And so I really felt that it was important to be able to offer that. Great, thank you very much. Um, the last question that we have here is, it looks like you're involved in a lot of different things. What is your favorite? The book, the blog, photography? Uh, my favorite would have to be photography. I love seeing the different wildlife. I love having an opportunity to watch it. And a perfect example of that is, I've been away for a week. I was driving home yesterday afternoon. and. I saw this little skunk coming up the, on the up onto the edge of the highway, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'd love a photo of a skunk. So I slow down and I wait, and of course that little skunk heads back, and he's going through the snow, and he's having a hard time kind of staying up on top, and, and he's sinking down, and I'm watching, and I'm thinking how hard it is for that little skunk to get around in the winter, and, and get around, we've had a recent snowfall, and the challenges that that's causing. So I probably, oh, I don't know how long I there, but maybe half an hour watching this little skunk and I parked on a, on a little approach and eventually the little skunk came along and it, and it came down beside and I got this really cool photo and I watched him dig down into the snow and, and get down underneath and his whole tail disappeared down into this soft snow and, and just what a privilege to be able to have that opportunity to sit and watch that animal in its environment of just doing the things that it does naturally and to, I just feel so blessed to be able to be part of that. That's really great. Thank you, Sherry. Um, that brings us to the end of our questions here. If anyone, any of our listeners have other questions for Sherry, please feel free to contact her after this webinar. Um, and Sherry, thank you very, very much for sharing all of your knowledge and expertise and passion with us. Um, for our listeners, please feel free to check out the PCAP website to look at more events going on for Prairie's Got the Goods Week. And this Video, this webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded to the PCAP uh, YouTube channel. And when you exit out of this webinar, you will receive a quick questionnaire. If you don't mind filling it out, it'll just take a minute. We would really appreciate that. So thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in, and thank you, Sherry, for, uh, for this excellent presentation. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you to everyone that listened. Thank you. Bye. Have a great rest of your day.